introducing Bishop Willeman, what can I say? What I'm reminded uh, is the words that I heard from the late Bishop James Matthew. Some of you know him. He passed away a couple of years ago, and uh, Eunice, Mrs. Uh, Matthew, is still here with us. Uh, and, you know, Bishop Matthew was a uh, son-in-law of Stanley Jones. So his love for India, I mean, we know the story. But he once told the Council of Bishops this story that, you know, to him, there are only two kinds of people in the world. One who visited Victoria Falls and those, and the others who have not. Wow. <laughs> that was a quite an introduction of what Victoria Falls was all about. So when there was a, a, a Council of Bishops meeting in, in Mozambique in 2006, after the meeting was over, Lisa and I <laughs> made all the arrangements to visit Victoria Falls. You know. That was a really powerful uh, introduction of what it was. And when I think of Bishop Willeman, I can just simply introduce him this way. There are only two kinds of people in the world, particularly in the Protestant community, particularly in the United Methodist community, those who know Bishop Willeman and those who do not know. <laughs> <laughs> and we all know him. <laughs> and then I don't have to repeat what is written in our flyer here. I mean, if you just read who he is among us, just mind-boggling. Wow! We have a gift of God, such as Bishop Willeman, among us, and claim as one of us, one of our bishops, to me, my colleague in ministry. What an awesome honor and privilege to have that connection with Bishop Willeman. I would like to say that he's my hero. I want to be like him. (laughs) Best way I can. He blesses our church, our community so richly. Uh, I just would like to say I'm so excited to have him as our guest speaker for this retreat. When I was in former annual conference, I wanted to have that kind of uh, opportunity to have Bishop Willem with us, but somehow it didn't happen. He is demanded so many places, so many times. uh, But when I found out that he was coming to this retreat, I was overjoyed, really. (laughs) Really looking forward to this opportunity to be with him and with God's people of Susquehanna annual conference. So it is truly my joy and privilege to introduce our beloved Bishop William H. Willeman. Thank you for that generous introduction. You're fortunate to have uh, Bishop Park with you now. Actually, I was invited by uh, Bishop Shearer, uh, kind of on her way out the door, and she... Middleton, excuse me, Bishop Middleton. Bishop Middleton would find it interesting that I made that uh, (laughs) mistake. Bishop Middleton on her way out the door, and uh, I and and she said uh, there'll be another bishop here, and uh, but I want to get this nailed down, and I said to her. You know, I'm I'm leaving my annual conference as well, and uh, I, there's a few things I'm doing to kind of get them back on my way out the door. Uh, I, I hope this is not that kind of invitation. And uh, she did imply that. Uh, she said, "I've been wanting to have you, uh, but on the other hand." Uh, I would probably be nervous about having you when I was here. So anyway, I'm Bishop Park's problem, and and uh, so, but I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, 
the planning team has uh, g- given us our theme, Journey into Hope. And so I've taken as my assignment to be hopeful, to reflect upon hope, uh, Journey into Hope. In many ways, our age is an age uh, which is an age of false hopes and dashed hopes. Uh, The 20th century, uh, one of the great political hopes was Marxism. It's amazing that Marxism, having been such a huge factor at the end of the 20th century, by the end of the 20th century, was clearly a hope that millions, having hoped in, no longer had hope for. Uh, I was talking to a young man who worked very hard uh, for the election of President Obama uh, during his first term. Uh, This young man had, in fact, taken off a semester of college to work in the Obama campaign. And I saw him about a year after President Obama had taken office, and I was, I said, what's your assessment of the president and his work? And this young man kind of shook his head, and he said, oh, I think I'm, I got buyer's remorse. Uh, he said, here we elected a president to get us out of Iraq, and he's gotten us much more deeply into Afghanistan in the process. Uh, he is a president that I had hoped would do something about gun control, and he's actually released the uh, some of the restrictions on uh, guns. And uh, and I said to him, "Well, you know, maybe you're just sort of growing up. You're realizing that uh, <clears throat> somebody can be a, a good enough leader, uh, but but not." a source of ultimate hope. And and when you think about it, behind every question of hope, like, is there any hope for tomorrow? That, for Christians, is a theological question. Is is there any ultimate hope? I know uh, when I'm, I'm now teaching at Duke Divinity School, so I put a list up on my door, for people to sign up if they needed to talk to me. And I was thinking of the people in the two classes I was teaching, but I was amazed that over half the people that signed up on the door uh, weren't even in my classes. Uh, I didn't even know these students. (laughs) And after a couple of weeks of this, I was telling my wife, Patsy, The major reason these people are coming to see me, I mean, one reason they're coming to see me is that I'm like one of the few people on the Duke Divinity School faculty who's ever uh, worked uh, (laughs) in the church. And, but the predominant question they come by asking me, these seminarians, these people on the threshold of their ministry, the predominant question is, could be summed up in, do you think, having done what you've done, uh, do you think there is any hope for the United Methodist Church? And and it's a sort of daunting question uh, given to someone kind of at the end of his career by these uh, at the beginning of their career. And... So all that is sort of making me think, well, the planning committee uh, is on to something here, that hope b- becomes an important question. Wherein is our hope? Uh, in, in what do we hope? Talking to a Duke doctor, and I was asking him, he was talking about that he was becoming fatigued in the practice of medicine, And he was noting that uh, he was enjoying being a doctor a lot less uh, than he did in the early days, even though in the early days he was working longer hours and all. But, and I asked him, well, 
What do you think is causing you kind of fatigue in the practice of medicine? And he said, well, it, th this is just a bad neighborhood for practicing medicine. And I said, Durham? And he said, no, I mean, just American culture. Because he said, it, it's kind of odd that one of the burdens of my profession is that Americans believing ridiculous things about medicine. And he said, I don't mind being somebody's doctor, but that's not good enough anymore. Now I have to be their savior. And I said, savior, that's, that's one of our words. Uh, <laughs> and he said, you know the often cited statistic that over half of all the resources expended on your health care will be expended in the last year of your life. And he said, that's a devastating statistic because none of that is health care. He said, if it's in the last year of your life, it's, it's, it's not health care. Uh, you know, we're not trying to promote your future health because you don't have a future. It's the last year of your life. And I said, well, but we don't know it's the last year of our lives. And he said, well, that's where we come in to give you the illusion that with really good medical treatment, you might be a god. You might be immortal. And I said, well, you know, now you're getting over into my area. Uh, but my heart sort of went out to him thinking now, it isn't simply that we ask for good medical treatment, but we ask for immortality, fantasy, management. <laughs> uh, that given enough resources and enough good scientists working on it, I might get to live forever. Uh, well, w when you live in a world of that kind of deceit, uh, self-deceit, it's kind of easy to see why hopelessness is a problem. For there is something in us that seems to put misplaced hope, that, that puts hope in the wrong things. Uh, coming through early this morning through the uh, security checkpoint at the Raleigh-Durham Airport, for the first time I noticed that over to the right there in right beyond the security area as we're taking off our shoes and our belts and <clears throat> everything. Uh, there, there's a little, like, shrine uh, that has a North Carolina flag and an American flag. And then it has a huge sort of poster there. And so I went over there to get a closer look at this since I'd ever noticed it. And basically, the poster has the names of everybody who died in the terrorist attacks <clears throat> on 9-11. And the words over the poster said, uh, this is placed here as a sign that we will never forget you. You're, you are immortal in our memories. And I thought, uh, wow, I know this is a prejudiced Christian comment, <clears throat> but the North Carolina flag and a wrinkled American flag next to a cardboard poster with names of people that I can't remember a single name there, that, that somehow that balances out the horror of that event, that, that somehow this is an adequate response uh, to that horrible tragedy. But then I thought, now wait a minute, it's, it's the world, and the world really has no greater resources for responding to such an event than to bring out the American flag and to uh, print this up on a poster in color and, uh, and, and, and somehow that is, is its hope. Um, well, we're Christians. 
And as Christians, we believe that the world has no hope except God who created the world and who continues to work in the world. That, that the only, finally, when all is said and done, as all will finally be said and done for everybody here, uh, at, th- there is no hope other than uh, a God that is determined uh, to have God's purposes realized. That somehow the same God that resurrected, crucified, to death, tortured to death by the government, Jesus, that that, that God will continue to be true to, to God's self. Um, and that's a little, well, not speaking of the world, but speaking of the church, I, I think that's, uh, that's a challenge for us. For it seems to me that our church is in great need of theological refurbishment. Uh, Many, I I agree with those who have charged that mainline Protestant Christianity in North America is in the grip of uh, what some observers have called moralistic, therapeutic deism. Uh, That what we've reduced the gospel to is moralism, that is, the gospel is something you are supposed to do or to think or to feel. Uh, moralism, something human beings do. Therapeutic. Uh, the gospel exists as therapy, as mainly uh, something of benefit to us to make us feel better or uh, to hurt less or to... Uh, and, you know, this describes a lot of our preaching... Uh, deism, that is the faith of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and all that is. Deism uh, was as much a God as American democracy could handle. Uh, and that is, uh, God created the world and then left uh, and said, hey, I've created a beautiful world. I've set up a whole lot of good natural laws and I love you. Promise me you won't change a thing and Goodbye. And, and, and moralistic, therapeutic deism. Uh, that is a God who is impersonal. A God who is never shows up, never intervenes, uh, never intrudes into human mechanisms. Uh, in other words, not much of a God, no God. Uh, therefore, no wonder there should be lots of people giving up hope. Uh, In the debate about guns, I've noticed that I'm a Methodist preacher for 40 years. I I have never had an instance in my entire ministry of any parishioner ever defending himself or herself with a firearm. I'm, I'm sure that must happen. Doesn't happen nearly as much as the NRA thinks it happens, but it, it, it must happen somewhere. Uh, although I've done about eight funerals for children uh, who have taken their own, killed themselves with their parents' firearms, uh, particularly young men. Uh, well, you know, what kind of world is it when, when that's, you know... Or, or what kind of, as a woman was pointing out to me, that, um, that how she was so deeply affected by the horrible uh, massacre at, at Sandy Hook. And yet, she said, then, then it was noted that, uh, hey, 4,000 children are killed every year in America with firearms, without any national outpouring. Uh, and, and she said, you know, what, how insensitive am I that that, that has pr- not provoked, because these children look like my children. Well, I, I, I'm just saying that I think the planning committee and 
you know, where is our hope? Um, well, I would say that if we've got a God that allegedly cares, but doesn't act, a God who is said to be love, but is not active love, uh, that, then I'm not sure wh- where there is hope. And, and one dilemma, I think, is that we are so accustomed to describing the world without God, it's... Um, it, it's a challenge, e- even for us in church, uh, to talk about the God who is. Um, I saw a sermon a while back from a preacher that preaches to a lot more people than I do. And the title of the sermon was, How to Get More Out of Worship. And the preacher started out the sermon by saying, you only get out of worship what you put into it. Uh, You can't just show up on Sunday morning. You need to prepare. You need to focus. You need to cultivate a teachable spirit within you. Uh, And when you come to worship, don't come there to... You know, criticize the choir for the selection of music or criticize the preacher. You come with a questioning mind. You, you come asking, what do I need in my life this week? What questions am I struggling with for which I need answers? And you come with a pencil and a notepad. And you take notes during the sermon. And then afterwards, at lunch, share those notes with people in the family. Uh, What did they get out of it? What answers did they receive? In reading this sermon, I said, uh, Rick, uh, (laughs) you know, I'm working with Methodists here. Uh, It's all we can do to get them to show up. Uh, They're not going to do homework, okay? Notice anything missing in that sermon? God. (laughs) What if it is a lie that you only get out of worship what you put into it? Most of us, had we the time, could testify that, in a sense, it ain't worship till God puts something into it. And that, that all those moments in your own life when you have shown up and you really haven't intended to worship. Uh particularly if you're the pastor and you're leading worship, you don't have time to worship. It's one reason we enjoy coming to these things and singing and because we're not in charge. Well, um, I, I noticed uh, one of the things I did as a bishop was I vowed to the Lord that I wouldn't appoint anybody uh, to a church, a full-time pastor that I hadn't heard preach because I'd A lot of lay people think it's unbelievable that people are appointed to churches that say we want a preacher and haven't heard them preach. So uh, I made that vow. I immediately regretted that vow, uh, (laughs) like like a lot of vows I've made to the Lord. Uh, But uh, this meant that I listened to a lot of sermons every spring. And um, most of the sermons I heard, I was impressed with. I thought they were engaging. They were prepared. They were interesting. And, but a major f- problem was that the, the God rendered in the sermons. I mean, there, there just didn't seem to be any heavy lifting for Jesus to do in the sermon. If that sermon is true then you certainly don't need Jesus dying and rising to make it work. Uh, If that sermon is true, then we have in our hands all we need. We just need a little push, a little motivation uh, to to live a hopeful life. Um, Thus I say that I, I think we're due for a refurbishment. And thus I come to my main point. And that is that a major source of hope is your calling, your vocation. Um, I don't mean to say like that you, uh, 
as a Methodist preacher or uh, the hope. Uh, but I'm, I do mean to say that you might be. Uh, and that that dynamic that you embody of being summoned, called forth in the ministry, that is for us a great source of hope because of what it says about the sort of God that we've got. Or more accurately, the, the way the Bible tells it, the sort of God who's, who's got us. Take me, for instance. Here I am, my ju- uh, junior year of college. I'm thinking about a lot of things, but I'm not thinking about ministry. And uh, one of my buddies says, Hey, why don't you... Uh, they're having a conference at Columbia College uh, next weekend. And uh, why don't we go down together? And I said, what's the conference about? And he said, well, it's something like exploring Christian ministry. And I said, well, what does that have to do with me? And he said, there are 600 women at Columbia College. <laughs> and I said, okay, all right. And I don't remember anything about the conference. Uh, the Friday night, we had some speeches. And then Saturday, there were some more talks and all. The only thing I remember Saturday evening, uh, sitting there on the floor of a dormitory room with four or five Methodist preachers from South Carolina, all of them young, <clears throat> hadn't been in ministry that long, and they were there at the conference to kind of uh, talk to us. And just sat there and listening to these preachers talk about their ministry. And this was during the uh, late 60s, South Carolina. One had had a cross burned on his yard. One had had his children beaten up on the school ground and called dirty names. Another's wife had been shunned at the supermarket. Uh, One had had a brick thrown through the back windshield of his car while at a church meeting. I thought Methodist preachers were people who walked around wearing suits and stuff. Uh, And it was a major moment for me uh, and my vocation. And if we had the time to tell everybody, we could go around in this room. And even, maybe particularly, if you're not clergy, you, you still could tell a story of vocation. Because in a sense, nobody comes to Jesus without first being called. That the, This is such a narrow way to walk that nobody does it without being summoned. Or as I've said about clergy, uh, being a pastor is too difficult to pay anybody to do it. You have to be forced into it. You... Uh, back at Duke I teach a course Introduction to the Ordained Ministry Ordained Leadership and the first thing I have students do is to write papers on their call to the ministry I I ask them how did you get here just tell that story in less than five pages and I love those papers Uh, for some reason Jesus this year appears to have worked a lot on patios uh, because five students mentioned being called by God while seated on a patio. I have no theory about why that is, but I remember the paper started out, I was a teenager from hell. I made my parents' lives miserable. They were shocked when I actually got into the University of Texas. And they were so glad to see me leave town. (laughs) They were not shocked when I flunked out of the University of Texas in one year. And I hung around in Austin. And I did odd jobs. And I lived with a succession of two different people. But I found, I met this Methodist preacher 
and started going to this Methodist church. And they enlisted me to coach the boys' basketball team. And one thing led to another. And I was shocked that I was feeling called to be a pastor. So I went back home, my little town in Texas, where my dad's a doctor. And I sat my mother and dad down Sunday afternoon after lunch, and I said, I want to tell you about something that's surprising that's happened in my life. Uh, I've just been reaccepted at the university. I'm going back. I'm going to get my degree in order to be a preacher. And with that, he said, my mother said, started crying. And she said, oh, I am so ashamed. I am so ashamed. I'm so embarrassed. And I said, embarrassed? Ashamed? What do you mean? And she said, well, I, you, I don't know if you remember, but I had two miscarriages before I had you. And so when I got pregnant with you, uh, I knelt down and I promised God, please, Lord, if you'll let me bring this baby to term, I promise to dedicate him to your work and to call him Samuel, just like Hannah did in the Bible. And Sam said, you did what? (laughs) And he said, you know, you could have saved me a heck of a lot of trouble. If you had remembered to tell me this story earlier. And she said, I didn't know it would work. I, I mean, this is something like Baptists believe. I, I didn't know. When I preached at the Texas conference, I wrote ahead and said, I need to meet your mother. Uh, I know that behind... Many clergy, there is a relentless mother, uh, but this is ridiculous. And uh, so, but even though that's a little odd, uh, everyone here is here as a Christian uh, by a similar miraculous, inexplicable intervention that in a way is itself a kind of validation that we serve a, a living God. Uh, and your vocation, your call, is a countercultural thing. This is not how Americans are taught to construe our, of our lives. How do we describe ourselves? Well, we're modern people. And the modern age was in great part uh, built upon the assumption that for the first time in history, you didn't have to, like, become a blacksmith because your daddy was named Smith and your daddy was a blacksmith. Uh, No, you could choose your life. You could fabricate uh, your future. Uh, You could... Uh, You were in charge of your own destiny for the first time in history. I choose, therefore I am. Uh, Freedom of choice becomes a kind of identifying characteristic of of people. Uh, Who are you? Well, I am who I am because of my various astute decisions and choices. Uh, And the notion that you are free to live whatever life you choose to live. That's a very, that's a modern notion. Note anything missing in that definition of a human being? (laughs) God. Uh, What if it is not true that the life you are living is your own? Uh, What if your choices are not the only choices and your decisions are not the only decisions uh, that that form your life. And, and Christians are, are trying to believe that. 
that your life is, is not self-fabricated. That, that your life is a story that's being told by God. Uh, Kierkegaard said that all of us are born with a set of sealed orders. <laughs> uh, we, we are being ordered in some direction and all the, the trouble is you don't get to open those. Uh, they have to be opened to you uh, by the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm just saying the notion that you don't get to decide on the significance and direction of your life, wow, that's a very non Western, non American kind of idea, and yet we believe it. Mary, how did you decide to get mixed up with the gospel? Uh, Paul, when did you decide that Christianity was the faith for you? Uh, you know, that's, that's just not the story. I remember being at a youth rally, uh, and after I spoke, the leader came out and said to the gathered teenagers, uh, now, <clears throat> We're only here for one reason tonight, and that is for you to make a decision for Jesus Christ. And don't say to yourself, I'm 16, nothing could happen to me. 16-year-olds die all the time. You better decide tonight. If you haven't made a decision, tonight is the night for you to make that decision. You make that, you come down here, you decide for Jesus Christ and I'm sitting there thinking, man, have you ever been around a 16-year-old in your entire life? Do you know some of the stupid decisions these people can make? Uh, so you telling me God is pacing around there saying, has that 16-year-old decided for me yet? Uh, I just can't get through the night unless I... Hey, if you want to tell them the way the, the Bible tells it, that who gives a rip? What some Alabama 16-year-old decides. The amazing thing is that in Jesus Christ, God has eternally made a decision for him. That's amazing. Uh, and that, and probably 16 is a great time for that to come through loud and clear. You don't know who you are. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing with your life. Let us tell you, God's got plans for you. God's got a purpose for you. Uh, that's vocation. Uh, we're, we're, I'm talking about a different view of a human being here. And, and I'm also talking about a different source of hope. And... It'd probably take you to explain to the world why that kind of external determinism uh, is good news. Was that a we had a church that had a ministry to the homeless in Birmingham. They fed about 150 homeless people every single morning of the week, uh, helped by a dozen United Methodist congregations. And I would go down there from time to time. And I walked in one morning and I see a man washing dishes. A lot of dishes to be washed when you feed that many people because the pastor of the church thinks it's tough enough being homeless without having to eat off paper plates and plastic glasses. So that means that a whole bunch of volunteers come in and wash the dishes of the homeless. <clears throat> And uh, so I see a man there that I recognize. Uh, I think I've met him. And, uh, oh, yes, he's a member of one of our most affluent congregations in Birmingham. So I come up and I say hello and, and all. And I look at him uh, down there with his hands down in this soapy dish water. And I say, you know, I think this is wonderful what you're doing. And he said, Good. And I said, just, uh, have you always enjoyed working with the homeless? 
And he looked up from his dishwater and he said, uh, who told you I enjoyed working with the homeless? And I said, well, here, here you are, uh, 7 o'clock in the morning down here washing dishes. I, I think that's pretty impressive. And he said, have you ever met any of the homeless? Uh, most of them out there are drug addicted, HIV positive, said crazy. There's a reason people don't want them at home. And I said, oh, well, you know, that makes all the more remarkable that here you are, 7 a.m., washing these dishes. How did you get here? And he looked up with aggravation and he said, I'm here because I got put here. How did you get here? <laughs> I said, oh, okay, yeah. Well, that... Uh, again, that's, that's a very different view of the point of life. Thus, when some dear sweet pastor would say to me, I can't go to that church. That church is backward and racist and out of it. And I said, well, you know, it's Alabama. And, and said, no, it's, it's like Mississippi. You, you, I can't go there. My wife would leave me if we were sent there. And I said, look, I don't care for these people any more than you do, but <laughs> for some, I mean, Jesus thinks they're worth dying for, you know, and um, I don't know why he's working out there, um, but look, this will come as a surprise to you, but I didn't have a great need to move to Alabama either, <laughs> uh, and, and yet it, it's turned out great, I've enjoyed it, so uh you go on out there and you try to enjoy Jesus working out there and uh, if they don't uh, kill you, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll be back in touch with you in, a, in the future. Um, Methodism practices a sent ministry. You can't call a Methodist preacher. You can't hire a Methodist preacher. They've got to be sent. But... In a sense, every church practices sent ministry. Every Christian is involved in sent ministry. That, that your ministry was God's idea before it was yours. That we actually believe that you're a living demonstration of God's will. Of the fact that our God is not only love, but is love in action. And that God not, not only intends to do something for the world uh, 2,000 years ago, but that, that God is busy, active now, in doing that same death-to-life dynamic that, that we see in Jesus. Um, and this, this can be a great gift. It can, it, it can be a great gift to know, you know, when you stand up before the, the bureaucracy uh, that is the modern denomination, Christianity, uh, when you stand before a congregation that said they wanted to hear the truth, but then find out they were lying about that too and um, when you are made unpopular because of what you feel compelled to say it is powerful freedom to know they don't own you that you have been spoken for that you are ordered to be here you are ordained you uh, you are externally authorized. Thus I said to the students, becoming pastors, you know, it can be a great challenge to love your congregation. Uh, sometimes you're in congregations with difficult people. Sometimes you're in congregations in a depressing, <laughs> difficult context. But as challenging as that is, in my own ministry, I found that's less challenging than loving Jesus, 
who has put you there. And that uh, there are lots of reasons why you're in love with the congregation. You know, they're paying your salary and you, you kind of need to be lovable among them. But uh, to love a Lord, you know, who says, uh, follow me. <laughs> and there's a cross that fits your back just fine. Uh, that, that can be one of the great challenges of ministry. But I'm also saying it, it's that which gives ministry its sense of adventure. And why ministry is so much more interesting than simply caring for people. Because it is a life lived connected to the truth about who God is and and who we are. And and what a wonderfully demanding God we've got. I, I was thinking last week during the debate over firearms and all, it basically as I heard it, you got two groups of people saying, uh, one group is saying, we need firearms for self-defense. And uh, the only defense against a bad person with a gun is somebody trained by the NRA with a gun. Uh, <clears throat> And we need to arm teachers. And I'm thinking, gee, you must not have had some of the wackos I had in junior high. <laughs> Whoa, I would not want my Latin teacher to be armed. Because she could hurt you bad enough, like, without even a gun. And, um, but then you got another group saying, that's crazy. We don't need more guns out there, particularly in the schools and all. What, that is just crazy. Uh, that that is no the the best self defense is to get the guns off the street and to get better mental health and um well it, it hit me now now what do you do when you actually believe that a Jew uh, from Nazareth who had a perfectly good opportunity to practice self defense refused. And, and that's devastating enough, but perhaps even more devastating is there is not one instance anywhere in all of the New Testament of anybody following him who practiced self-defense. I mean, if you can't believe in self-defense, what can you believe in? I, I guess Jesus Christ is Lord. I mean, you could, uh, is, is, and, and the NRA isn't. Uh, well, uh, you know, it, it, it's one of the fun things about ministry is you get to discover that Jesus Christ is even more interesting than you first thought and, and ever more demanding. Uh, and wherein is our hope? You know, I'm saying that, that God called you and I know as a bishop, from time to time, people would say, do you think the church will ever change? Do you, do you honestly believe the Methodist church uh, is, is going to change what it's doing? And I, I said, well, you know, not if you go to general conference. <laughs> but, you know, but I said, those, those are the wrong people. And anyway... <laughs> Uh, but uh, remember who you're talking to here. I'm from Greenville, South Carolina. Okay. Uh, I grew up getting on a city bus every day that had a sign saying "Colored patrons sit from the rear, white patrons sit from the front," and nobody ever questioned that. Now, you're going to tell me people can't change? You're going to tell me that the Holy Spirit is stumped by our present sin? I'm just sorry. I, I, I can't believe that. Uh, because in my own soul, I've experienced death to life, resurrection. Well, uh, 
And also, it, it, it means that when you're talking to people and you're ministering to people and people say, oh, I've, I've reached a dead end and, uh, oh, there's no hope for me and, you know, is, or is any hope for my son who's addicted to cocaine? And, you, you know, you can say that, you know, if God has not raised Jesus Christ from the dead, no, <laughs> there isn't any hope. Uh, however, uh, after God did that, it, it, we're just we're never surprised uh, by what God can do. Uh, we we see that as a kind of foretaste of of the great cosmic transformation God intends and, and is actively working. I must say that's one of the great perks of getting to teach at a seminary is I just have this almost daily experience uh, with these seminarians of thinking, uh, wow, uh, it's like Jesus is saying to me, uh, hey, I'm giving you everybody you need to be a faithful church. I'm giving you all that you need. Now, the problem is, uh, you got a board of ordained ministry that can't conceive of ministry except as clones of themselves that drove us into this. Uh, or you think the wise way of discernment is by following these 10 pages of uh, rules to make Methodist clergy, but that's your problem. I didn't create that, you did. Now, I'm sending you everybody you need. And a lot of them are people that you are not going to be comfortable being around because I'm sending them to dismantle a lot of the world you thought you had to have. Well, I'm, I'm, well, I, I'm just saying that instills one with hope because you realize it, it ain't all in our hands. And it isn't over until God says it's over. And after you've had your life reached in and seized and commandeered uh, by the Holy Spirit, I think it just provokes uh, an extravagant view of God. Uh, I was leaning on a student a few years ago because she informed me that even though nothing would please her more than to have the paper that I signed on the first day of class, uh, she had some work to do in some really important courses. <laughs> and so my paper would not be done for at least a week or two. And I said to her, you know, this really is unacceptable. Uh, your procrastination is uh, just pathological. You know, you're, you're, you're planning on being a minister. It's not like, you know, you're going to do something like easy, like be a lawyer or something. And I mean, you're going to be a pastor. You can't stand up on Sunday morning and say, I would love to have had a sermon for you today. <laughs> but it's been a very busy week and one thing and another. And so let's break up into discussion groups with newsprint. <laughs> uh, and she said, hey, 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 back off, Okay. And she said, you got some problem with me being here preparing to be a pastor? Uh, let me tell you, you're not so smart. Any problem you got with me, I have already noted that to the Lord, okay? <laughs> and uh, let me just tell you, for your information, procrastination, <laughs> that's the least of my sins, okay? <laughs> and... Uh, she said, you got some problem with me being in this class or something, why don't you take it up with the Lord, okay? In fact, you'd do me a favor if he will listen to you more than he's listened to me. <laughs> and she was right. I mean, she was so right. Um, and how can I make that kind of God dull? I, I just, you know. Anyway, um, so... Uh, is wherein is our hope? Just for tonight, you know, one of the hope is that that we got a God 
that refuses to stay confined in heaven, in God's godness. But this God calls, summons, empowers, commandeers, commands, uh, and therein is our hope. In, in uh, the time remaining, um, I just wondered if you if you got some response to this or a rebuttal to it or questions or enjoy hearing those before we're done. Yes. Um, you talked about uh, theological refurbishment. So I'm wondering um, who, who are our, our sort of our new theologians? Uh, 21st century. And who would you see? I mean, for instance, I'm, you know, I'm reading Stephen Long right now. Oh, Steve Long, yeah, former no, no, student. I really understand. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying. But I mean, who, who, are, who do you think are those? Well, you know, uh, Steve Long, he is, his daughter was at Duke, so he's kind of aging out. Uh, but. Uh, but I think I like your, you know, who's the new, um, I'm impressed that I think we do have a new generation that uh, reads the world differently than I, that is asking for different things. And, and I was in campus ministry for 20 years, which gave me a front row seat on new generations coming along. And... I'd say um, that that there is that sense about the only interesting things the church has to say to the world are theological. That that we come to the world not with a better pattern of making the world work better, but that we we know who's in charge. I mean, we know who is Lord, who sits on the throne. Yeah. I'm just impressed, and, and I think a lot, I'm, I'm thinking of a lot of students I have that kind of grew up, uh, many of them as Methodist, and, and what they think they heard was, uh, okay, let's, let's all be nice boys and girls, and, and, and let's, let's try to uh, work hard uh, uh, and do this or do that, and they, they, they knew enough to know that's not, the fullness of the gospel. That that's so. So I think um, I think of people like uh, Jason Biasy, a former student of mine. He's now pastor in Boone, North Carolina. Um, uh, that uh, and I, boy, I could go on. But I, I think particularly I'm impressed with young, many of our young clergy uh, that appear to be part of a generation uh, raised by my generation that kind of wants different things and sees different things. and uh, so, so I like, I could probably name some people. Unfortunately, you know, most of my interlocutors tend to be people kind of my age and my generation. But uh, I am impressed um, with a lot of young thought, um, yeah. That <clears throat> I remember meeting. I, I used to do the baccalaureate at Duke University, four back-to-back services, packed, and to kind of get me primed for the sermon, I'd meet with a group of graduate graduating seniors and just have a conversation with them about what's going on. And I remember the time meeting with them, and I, I asked them. What would you like to have happen in the baccalaureate sermon now that I've told you what that is? And one of the students said, you know, we're going to get so much advice this weekend. We'll hear so many platitudes. I just hope you'll talk about God because that's really the only thing you know a lot about. Uh, <laughs> In this university, there's so many people who know so much more about economics than you do and politics and this and that. So I just hope you talk about God. He said, I'm not even sure if I believe in God, but I sure expect you to say something about God that will point me in that direction. So I remember that 
Yeah. If that's a response to. Yes. When a pastor has something that he or she feels has to be said to a congregation, that could be a direct tension with where they are, what they believe, what they want to do. How can we judge whether it's our own prejudices or just mere emotional response or a biblical God uh, generated conviction that we want to bring? Oh, I love your, the way you phrase that, your humility. Um, I, you you kind of took that in a different direction than I thought you would. I was asking, uh, if you're over there, um, what do you do, here's my rephrasing, what do you do when you're pastor and you feel you've got something to say that will cause friction, tension in the congregation? How can you be sure that that's not just you working out your stuff? Uh, or it's God. Uh, <laughs> I re- I do not know. <laughs> uh, and you may be thinking about my presentation right now by saying, you know, <laughs> there's nothing about the NRA in Matthew's gospel. Uh, you know, for him to launch into that. Um, but I love that question. I can tell you're a seasoned preacher. But I think it's amazing that, that you're able to keep that kind of... Uh, I've, I've been ashamed of myself at various moments in ministry, realizing that my great prophetic sermon probably had more to say about me than the gospel at that moment. Um, on the other hand, preaching is a risky enterprise to stand up and say thus saith the lord wow it, it's a and it, it it doesn't help much to say by the way this is not me saying this this is the holy spirit i'm just an instrument i'm just it's just flowing straight through me um with a southern accent uh but um and, you know, I think, I, I love that. I, I think at the end of the day, we preachers, that ought to be the question we ask is, and I love Wesley, you know, when preachers would come and brag to him about how many people converted and they preached for two hours and, you know, Wesley was, did you offer Christ? Uh, and I could imagine preachers say, well, well of course, of course. But I hear Wesley just saying, you know, you can, you can preach yourself a lot when you presume to be preaching Christ. Uh, and I think that's why to be a preacher, I think, means to believe in forgiveness, uh, to, to, to realize, too, that my thoughts may not be God's thoughts and, and all, at the same time, I think it, uh, I'm glad you moved the way you did with that because I thought you were going to say, you know, what do you do if you really feel compelled to say something and you know it's going to upset the congregation and you know it'll be in tension? That's a fair question. And preachers, um, you know, you've you got to work with these people. You, you, you'd like to. You've you got to get their trust. But you also got to get Jesus' trust that you're willing to say the truth as it's delivered to you. Um, I just finally to say that Reinhold Niebuhr, I love it in his uh, Leaves of a Notebook of a Tame Cynic, his diary when he was a young preacher in Detroit, he said that before he became a preacher, he thought there were so many dull sermons and so many cowardly sermons because preachers were cowards and that they were... These people are paying you a salary and you better be careful what you say to those people or you'll get fired. And Niebuhr said, okay, there may be some of that in preachers, but he said, I quickly learned the main reason, the main factor against truthful preaching is love. You learn to love these people. You get a front row seat 
on their low-level misery. Uh, you know how tough it is for many of them. And you do not want to make their lives more difficult by offering them Christ. <laughs> and, wow, to me, that I, I, I resonate with that because if, if you ask me, why didn't you speak out on that subject? And I say, oh, well, these, uh, these are very limited people. Uh, they're uh, blue-collar uh, people, and they, they don't think, uh, they're not capable, you know. Uh, pro- probably it was my own kind of paternalistic self-protection was a greater factor. Uh, so, I just, I love the way you put it, even though I have absolutely no answer to it. Um, but I'm, I'm guilty of that. <laughs> uh, usually I don't know I'm guilty of it till about two weeks afterwards. <laughs> and... Then it's too late to say, uh, by the way, any of y'all here two weeks ago for that sermon? I take that back. Uh, actually, I was feeling bad that morning. And <clears throat> Yes? I, I had read your book, Bishop, and in that book, you, I think you pretty much said, retired bishops ought to be quiet. <laughs> uh, I was only speaking of the... At council of bishop meetings, I wasn't <laughs> speaking of, but but you could make a good case that uh, no, I, I if you're talking about the book Bishop, I did kind of reflections on what I thought I'd learned as bishop. Uh, the council of bishops just has a real problem uh, with people like me with retired bishops, in that unlike any other Methodist preacher anywhere. Uh, you know, when you get to be retirement age, we will say thank you, and you can stand on the stage. Please don't say anything, though. We don't have time for all that. Um, you're retired. Uh, you may be called into service in various capacities, but you are retired. Um, bishops, through a strange, I think, anomaly, uh, I've got this thing where every time the bishops are bishops for life and um, bishops uh, are expected uh, to attend the meetings of the council of bishops. And uh, it's just an odd kind of situation. I, I know, I mean, how would you like to be pastor for church and your successor shows up for every board meeting? And... Uh, you know that that that'd be a ridiculous position to put your success your your predecessor in or or you in uh well that's so anyway i'm not going to any council of bishops meetings i would like to go to some but now i've said so much uh <laughs> I, i'm sure they would condemn me um and um you know there's a lot to be said for wisdom for continuity, for seniority, for experience. There's virtually nothing to be said for those things in the United Methodist Church today. Uh, I think those values are strangling us. We have no seniority system in the United Methodist Church. And yet, in every conference, that is ruthlessly enforced, uh, even though we don't have it. Uh, the sense that, you know, my years being around here ought to count to something and how I'm deployed. I think, uh, you know, anyway, for bishops to be exempt from that just seems odd to me. So, you know how, how we retired people are. We, we like to talk a lot. And we, we like to tell you about things that we wish we had accomplished um, that now we want you to work on. Uh, so... It's not a big deal, but it, I think, would help. Uh, Francis Asbury, I am sure, never, in making Methodist bishops a lifetime thing, uh, never intended for bishops to live this long. <laughs> you know what I mean? If, I'm sure for Asbury, if you're effective, you'll die <laughs> at early. And, and we'll give you a service and talk about he just burned himself out for the gospel. <laughs> you know, and, and so there was no intention. Um, 
At the last Council of Bishops meeting, we have like 52 active bishops. And uh, <clears throat> at the last meeting, I noticed uh, present were 50 retired bishops and spouses. That, that's just not the way to have a productive meeting uh, that, that uh, grapples with present realities. Although the Council of Bishops has made some modifications and the active bishops are meeting and uh, alone for a couple times a year and, and I wish them well. So, but maybe one last uh, question or comment. Yeah, uh, you had said about um, God being at work in the world and, and, and people sensing the presence of Jesus in their lives and understanding that Jesus is active in their lives. And I work a lot with people in the community and sometimes, I don't, it's not an impression, just an observation for you to comment on, but um, I noticed that often the people outside of the church structure, they're not church or particularly to have a deep sense of Jesus at work in their lives. But if I ask people within the congregation, where's Jesus? Where did you see Jesus in your life? They're, they're stumped with this question. And it's perplexing hmm. to me. That's an interesting observation uh, that w when you talk to people kind of outside the church, th there are people out there and they seem to have a vivid sense of God's reality and activity. When you talk to some people in your congregation, they seem to have less. Um, you know, I'm, I, here's a positive view of that, and, and that is that, uh, hey, um, one reason we have the church is, is for those of us who have real difficulty being Christians. Uh, it, we, we couldn't possibly do it by ourselves. Uh, I, I said in a book I did on salvation, you know, um, that that old church statement, uh, there's no salvation outside the church. You know, I, I don't know how we can theologically say that. However, that's true for me <laughs> in the sense that I just can't imagine my salvation without the church constantly working on me and making me do things I wouldn't have done on my own and telling me things I wouldn't have told myself. Uh, it also may be, you notice uh, Luther noted that the first beatitude is blessed are the poor in spirit. That's kind of amazing that the very first blessing Jesus says, blessed are those of you who just don't have much spirit. Blessed are you who are spiritually inadequate. Blessed are you who are spiritually inept. Uh, wow. Luther said, the reason you start with that is, if you begin the sermon thinking, I'm, I'm pretty spiritual, I'm, I'm pretty good in spirit, I've got a good bit of spirit. By the time the preacher finishes with you, telling you to turn the other cheek to forgive your enemies... Everybody looks wretched spiritually. Uh, well, um, so I'm just saying that what better place for people for whom the spiritual life doesn't come easy than the church, where we make you show up and we make you say the Apostles' Creed even when you don't believe it, uh, make you pray the Lord's Prayer even when you don't want to pray. And, and uh, on the other hand, it, it's disturbing your observation, I, I think, because is any way that the church sort of squelches the Holy Spirit, uh, tames God, domesticates the divine in such a way that we church people get way too familiar with God. We, we get too casual um, and, and we forget what... Uh, a challenging thing it means to come before a living and righteous God because we think we've done that so much it's it's just out of habit. So that, uh, one thing I did, it's just a spiritual discipline for me as a bishop was I tried to spend at least an hour every couple of weeks with a non-Christian. 
And, and it was easy because my office was on a college campus and I could find a Muslim, I could find a Hindu. Eventually, I just started uh, trying to get good old godless pagans um, <laughs> because I thought, gee, I've, I don't know one instance of us ever losing a Methodist to Hinduism, uh, but we've lost millions to just godlessness. Uh, so anyway... Um, but one thing I, I, I almost, we, every time would have this experience of thinking, wow, God is busy in your life. Totally, nothing we've done, I've done. Wow, that's just amazing. And I would have this experience of walking away from those conversations, hearing Jesus say, uh, let me hear you say, John three sixteen, God so loved the church and me and my friends who look a lot like me that he gave his only begotten son, whoever. Uh-uh. It's all mine. I, I own it all. Now, they don't know that yet, but isn't it amazing that you, as a religious professional, talking to them, thinking, wow, I'd love to have you in my church. By the way, I, I hope you do invite them. Uh, and to to join up, and, and one reason you invite them is to say, "Oh, do we need you?" Uh, I got a lot of people that would just be in awe of your ability to speak about things of the spirit uh, the way you do, uh, and and I pray that we won't dampen any of that or make that commonplace.